Welcome to our spoiler-free review of The Shining, Escape from the Overlook Hotel, the second escape room, escape room in a box style game using the Coded Chronicles <laughs> system. Before we get going, I want to take a moment to thank the op for sending us a pre-release review copy of this game. Now, just to make it clear, we're the game we are talking about is The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel, soon yep. to be released in November by the op, and not just The Shining, released earlier this year by Funko, and designed by Prospero Hall, or the self-published Shining game from Matthew Natterhoft, released in 1998. Yes. I will personally note that the SEO uh, of whatever uh, search system that BGG implements uh, has really actually impressed me because the first time we started talking about this game, if I typed The Shining into the BGG search engine, this game didn't come up. Mm -hmm. And now it's the third one on the list because I've been searching it yep. regularly and other people <laughs> have been searching it regularly mm -hmm. as it comes up. So uh, it's it's interesting that as the game becomes more popular, BGG starts recognizing it as a real game. Yes. Yeah, it was interesting because Sean's like, it's not on there. I'm like, it's number five for me. And that was yesterday. Yep. So it's moved from five to three yep. just overnight. All right. So The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel was designed by Jay Cormier and Sen Foon Lim, sometimes known as the Bambruzel Brothers, two awesome Canadian game designers. This is the same team that did the first Coded Chronicles game, which is Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion. Both of these games were published by The Op. This escape room in a box style board game plays one or more players, uh, literally says one to 999, split over to two acts. Now, Board Game Geek claims each act will take about 90 minutes. It took us significantly longer than that, though this was mainly due to issues we will discuss later. To see for yourself what you get in this puzzle-filled game, check out our unboxing video on YouTube. Don't worry, we don't spoil any of the puzzles, we just show off the first couple of cards and components that won't make any sense to you at all. And probably not. Now, in order to save some time tonight for a full breakdown of the components, you will have to check out the, the YouTube video or the written review on the blog. Just quickly, you get a rule book, four different clue books, a deck of clue cards, some room tiles, a couple standees, and a number of sealed envelopes. Now, what I will note here is I dig the work that went into theming these components. Like the envelopes are an Overlook Hotel envelope, like as if you were going to send a letter from this hotel that doesn't exist. And the books look like various journals. And I particularly liked Danny's composition book because I own many of those very, like it looks like a composition book. And I just thought that was a nice touch. So when we're looking uh, at components, uh, it's a very similar set to what we get with Scooby-Doo mm. with a different theme, obviously, where the Scooby-Doo Escape from Haunted Mansion, just with very different theming. Yes, very different theming. All right, to start off a game of The Shining Escape from the Overhooked Hotel, you're going to read a specific entry in one of the books. This entry sets the tone and also directs you to set up the first room and put one of the two characters in play. Now, the story here starts in media res, meaning like right in the middle of the action, and man, does it do a great job of ramping up the tension right from the start. How? Well, you're going to have to play to find out because I don't want to give anything away, but I will just say it was very well done for getting the mood and getting you Oh, into the oh my god right from the start now from here players will be working together using the characters who are present to interact with items in the room each character has two skills wendy can look and use danny can look and shine when using a skill what you do is you're going to place the character standy next to an item on the map and the items on the map are going to have two or three digits numbers on them so to look in the drawer you would put wendy next to the drawer you would look up her look number which is one you'd look up the drawer number which is 203 i'm making up these numbers off the top of my head and you would look up 1203 in the book and read it out to see what you've discovered reading entries in the book are often going to unlock new things in the form of clue cards being flipped over sealed envelopes being opened and doing this is going to add new rooms to the map and new things for you to interact with so now i noticed that two uh, characters share a skill do they both use the same book for looking at things or does it matter who looks at an item each character's look skill is completely different and each character has their own book. So what it is, is looking from a different perspective on things. And what's fascinating here for anyone who doesn't know the background is you are looking from an adult's perspective and a child's, which can be very important for finding clues. 
Now, unlike the other Coded Chronicles game, uh, there is a bit of a bit more mechanics, a little bit more fiddliness to this edition with Wendy's usability. It works a little differently. For Wendy's ability, you have to have discovered an item with a single digit number on it. This is generally something you'd carry around. Um, you're then gonna combine that number with a two digit object, either another item card on, or something on the map. And then the number of Wendy's use skill, which is two. So that again, gets you a four digit number that you'll look it up in the books to see what happens when you use that object with this other thing. Right. So it's actually a use X with Y as opposed to a use object. So you yes. can't use a door, but you can use a key with a door. Exactly. That's exactly the way it works. And the only way to use the skill is to combine things. Like you can't even use this skill on a three digit item in the game. Like there, there wouldn't be a way if the door is a three digit item, you wouldn't be able to use the door. Now, some entries will lead you, and this is another big difference from Scooby-Doo, to what the game calls unscripted endings. This means your group did something wrong. You had the wrong answer to a puzzle. You went the wrong way. You wasted too much time. Uh, again, for people who know the background, Jack caught you. Uh, you're going to record each time you get an unscripted ending and then go back and try something else. Right. Now, familiar uh, to anyone who used a bookmark to go back and try again in a which way book. But yeah. this time you have to keep score when you do it. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Now, in addition, and this is the, the, the closest I'm going to get to a spoiler tonight. There is a timing element to this game that's unlocked early. I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to tell you how it works or any more than that. But just know that there is a timing element that is going to give you an in added incentive not to waste time. And an additional penalty for when you try a code combination that isn't in a book. So when you go to try to use the door and it doesn't work because the knife in the door just doesn't get the door open, you need the key. Note this is in game. This isn't an actual physical timer. Like you're not you're not putting on a timer or anything. This is in game time being spent. So unlike Scooby Doo, you don't want to take the time to try out every potential combination no. as you're going along just to see what you get. Correct. Now, if you do get stuck on a puzzle there on the back of the rule book, there's a list of the main puzzles in the game with entry numbers. You can look up for clues and there's a variable number of clues for each of the different puzzles. Now, while looking these up, there may be a penalty for looking or might not. What's good to see, in my opinion, this is the same thing that's in the exit games, is that if you look up a clue and it doesn't give you anything new. Like if you already knew that the thing you had to do was to count the things and the clue says count the things, you're like, yeah, well, duh, then you don't get penalized. It's only when you say you have to count the things and, and you're like, oh, I didn't get the end. That's when it's going to count against you. Now that's it. You continue the game like this, exploring the Overlook Hotel, finding clues, solving puzzles until hopefully you escape. At the end of the game, you're going to calculate a final score based on how many of those unscripted endings you've marked off during your play. Right. Now, interestingly, they t they call them unscripted endings. And I wonder how much of this uh, is related to the fact that film buffs will usually know that Kubrick took many liberties with this <laughs> film, uh, much to the dismay of Stephen King. And yeah. part of that was the ending. Now, there were also many other endings that were considered during the scripting process, uh, the writing of the screenplay uh, that never made it to uh, to film. But uh, there, it, there was a many branches that could have gone on to uh, celluloid mm -hmm. for this making of this movie. So while talking to Jay Cormier about this game, about which we'll talk a bit more in a little bit, this is meant to perfectly recreate the movie with them throwing in puzzles that make sense in the movie. So you are playing out the, the actual movie version, not the book version. And from what I understand, some of the unscripted endings were alternative endings. So, and that's why they go with it. And actually, when you read the books, it says the movie didn't end this way or something. I forget the actual words it uses. Okay. You, you can see that paragraph a lot, depending <laughs> on how, how you do things. Right. So one of the nice features of this game, again, carried over from Scooby-Doo, is that at the halfway point of the game, after solving about half the puzzles, the game gives you a chance to save the game. Here, the game goes through a quick cleanup where it's like, you don't need any of this anymore. Put it back in the box. And then here is what you have to have to go forward, which I think is really useful because it makes sure you didn't miss anything. Now, if there's anything you missed going forward, you're going to take un unscripted ending penalties for anything you miss. So it's like, look, you need to have 
cards six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You're like, ooh, I never got eleven. Well, you now get to get eleven. You don't get to find out what you missed, but you get the clue you need to continue. But you got to take one of those penalties. Right now, as uh, as people might remember, we did discover a slight problem in this aspect mm-hmm. of the game for the Scooby Doo game. Uh, was it more complete for this one? I all I can say right now is maybe, because <laughs> I'm not totally sure. Uh, a bit more about that in a little bit. So before I get into my thoughts on this game, I, I do have to point out, first of all, um, how much I love Scooby-Doo, our entire family. We loved the first Crota Chronicles game. Like to me, that's if it came out in 2019, it's a game of year 2019. If it came out in 2020, it deserves to win at least family game or kids game, something. It's got to win something. We were blown away by this. This was literally one of the best family gaming experience we've had together with the kids laughing out loud and excited to play and bouncing up and down like three-year-olds. It was insane how excited my kids got. The game was fantastic. Yes, there was a little, little twinge there there was a little issue but it wasn't game breaking and we had so much fun playing that if it wasn't for how much i enjoyed that i probably wouldn't have asked the op to review this one indeed and i would say the review was quite glowing for (laughs) scooby-doo uh and online there was plenty of talk with the creators Uh, i even jumped into a couple of threads about what other content would be a great Mm -hmm. match for this system now, one of the reasons this game probably wouldn't have entered me at all without playing Scooby-Doo is I've never read the book. I've never watched The Shining. It came out when I was five, and I just never, like, I didn't really watch horror movies growing up. I know literally nothing about it except Red Rum, All Work, No Play, and Here's Johnny. And I don't even know what those relate to. Like, I have no context. Those are just, like, cultural memes that are out there that I've heard. I know nothing what they mean at all. So... That leads me to my first problem with the Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel. Though I don't know if it's necessarily a problem, but compared to Scooby-Doo, I I was familiar with Scooby-Doo, obviously. I grew up in the 80s. I know what Scooby-Doo was. But after playing that game, I didn't feel I needed to know Scooby-Doo. Yeah, I would have got some of the inside jokes. I would have not known what rut row means. And I would have understood why Scooby's, why Shaggy's always hungry or whatever. And, and as a perfect example is my kids know the bare minimum about the license. To the fact they were confused there was a talking dog. Like the first time Scooby talked, they're like, what? The dog could talk. That's how little they knew about Scooby-Doo. But we had zero problem engaging with that game. Any of us. Unfortunately, we didn't find the same thing here with The Shining. A uh, very license knowledge specific game. Now, I can't say I'm honestly surprised in this particular case. Um, and uh, I had been wondering earlier if you if it was based off a movie or use the book. And I guess Jay has cleared that yeah. up for us. So it is clearly the movie yes. in this case. It is the movie edition. Um, to be honest, it actually starts partway through the movie and references things that happened earlier in the movie, which was just confusing. Like, to be honest, people who know The Shining are going to know what I'm talking about. And people who don't are going to feel like I did when we started playing this game. Because the first Danny entry we read had some character named Tony talking. And Danny was talking to Tony, but there was only one person in the room. And I had no idea what was going on. There was no explanation of who Tony was. Now, after a few entries, we were able to kind of put together what was going on. But even then, we still weren't sure until after the fact. I now know a little bit more. And once mom got involved and whatever. And and like, I know the early puzzles would have made a lot more sense if we'd been familiar with Danny and his particular abilities, we'll just say. We had similar issues with some of the other characters, right? Like, why are we worried about Grady? I still don't know who Grady is or why we should be worried, but man, we had to be worried about Grady. Along with this, there was all kinds of things that reference stuff that already happened. Like there's the thing from when she did this to Jack. And I'm like, when she did what? That happened in the movie before this game started. Like I, I at first I assumed this is what it was and now it's been confirmed. I talked to Jay and sure enough, this starts partway through the movie. So you're expected to know all the stuff leading up to this point. And no, the game is not unplayable without knowing the source material. Like we were able to complete the game. We played through it and we we got the overall story, but it just felt like we were missing out on things. And we felt a bit lost during parts of the story because we weren't familiar with The Shining. Now, I, I, it's unfortunate, but at the same time, honestly, probably not something that's all that likely in the real world. Uh, yeah. It's, you know, I, I highly doubt that people who aren't familiar with the Shining are going to be in too much of a rush to go out and purchase something that is very much licensed IP content. I don't know about that just because of how good Scooby-Doo is. 
I think there's going to be a lot of people who play Scooby-Doo and then do like I do and go, man, that Coded Chronicle system's awesome. I want to try the next game, whether they know the license or not. Well, I mean, that's what I'd worry. Th- those people might watch the movie first, though. That's true. <laughs> and to be honest, I almost did. Right. Sean was actually the one that talked me out of it. Said, well, I'd rather hear in a review of if the game works without knowing the license. Because we almost we almost rented it online somehow. I, we found it for sale on one of the yeah, there's Amazon a, it's, 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 it's actually a, It's actually in movie theaters right now. Um, oh, it's, wow. It's a 40-year anniversary. Ah, uh, okay, there you go. Which makes sense why two board games for it came out <laughs> this year. All right, so... That was one issue. We didn't know The Shining. It didn't ruin the game, though. That that wasn't the biggest problem with it. The biggest problem was, which thankfully is one, the rest of you should not have to worry about whatsoever. So you're going to have to listen to all this and kind of forget it in a way, because it ends up the copy we got was an early review printing. And I am sorry to say had some serious issues. In particular, there were a few wrong entries as well as missing entries in the books. One of them being the first puzzle in the game literally the first puzzle you were to solve was missing the clue to solve it. I ended up having to flip through the clue deck to try to find a certain object only because I was able to read the answer that said, put this thing with this thing that we didn't have. Like one, like I had to find the card. Then I had to go through the book and I'm like, all right, I'm going to go through the book and find out how we should have got this card. It wasn't there. It didn't exist. There was no entry that would have ever led us to that clue. Instead, there was an entry we read that we were confused by, but not too confused. Cause we just thought it was another weird Danny thing. <laughs> I guess we we're like, I don't know. He's talking to someone else now, <laughs> right? That's how we thought it was having missing information, which led to an unsolvable puzzle. The first puzzle of the game the game was as broken as master of the universe at that point. Like it was, you you couldn't continue. Like we had to figure out a fix that let us progress. It just kind of ignored it. Went Well, these two things go together because the book says they go together and we'll just keep playing. Right. Yeah. You never want to hear your game referred to as just as bad as masters of the universe. Yes. Uh, But it's a problem that one runs into with previews versus reviews. See the problem that with that was, this wasn't meant to be a preview as far as I knew. Like this was the first official printing of the game. I was supposedly getting a retail copy being sent out to reviewers. I had no idea I was getting anything different from what people would find in stores. Now, again, you can kind of throw all this out because I have confirmation from the op. That's the publisher that this issue was noted by other reviewers. They got the information back to the op in time and they were able to fix it for the initial retail print run. So no one reading this should have to worry about this problem. However, I got to say, like, it kind of affected our feel of the entire game going forward. Which is completely understandable as an unplayable game is really hard not only to enjoy, but also to review. (laughs) Yeah, it was interesting. So I said, we managed to get past. We brute forced our way past the first puzzle, right? We basically skipped it and went, all right, we're done the first puzzle. Um, Let's keep playing. And the rest of it went pretty well. Now, there were other problems. Now, this is going to affect everyone. The graphic design in this game, I would call questionable. Some of the text and writing on the cards is very small. Like, this isn't like background info on the cards or just pretty artwork. This is information that's required to solve some of the puzzles. We actually went and grabbed the magnifying glass after revealing the first couple clue cards to be able to make things out. Added to this is the, the 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 very deliberate choice of a very dark color scheme for the room and map cards. Some of these are so dark that it's hard to tell exactly what a number on the card is supposed to be. Like there's a number floating here, what's it mean? Both of these design issues combined made puzzles where you had to look for and count things in the various room cards needlessly difficult. Right, Well, and while I understand you want to build an aesthetic, it's also probably the case that there are fewer younger fans of a movie that came out 40 years ago. Yes. So aging eyes are a problem more so with a game like this than yeah. a game aimed at a younger audience. All right. My final complaint about the shiny escape from the overlooked hotel are many of the, the two digit items, right? We talked earlier about how Wendy has that use ability, which is meant to combine one object with a two digit object. The problem is we were having a real hard time telling what the things were. Like here we have a room with a ballroom and there's a number 23 on it that's just sitting on the floor. What is 23? 
And like, I, I, like, I had literally no clue. Is that a window? Is it the carpet we're interacting with? What is 23? So like, we're literally just grabbing something like, like we can't look right. So any of anything else in the room, if it's a three digit work, right? So if it was 123, we could use either of the characters to look at it. And then you'd look up that entry and it would say, Hey, I found a carpet on the floor and it would make sense, but you couldn't look at the two digit objects. So you just like fumbled around. You're like, I don't know what that is. Let's try using the knife. So let's look up 2823. And then you'd look it up and it'd be like, Jack comes at you with the ice pick. You're like, whoa, Jack, we haven't even seen Jack. What, what's going on? You're like, oh, obviously that's a wrong entry. So now we have to take a penalty because we couldn't tell what the thing on the map was. That was a little rough. Yeah, that's 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 unfortunate. And while I expect some of this can be chalked up to not knowing the source material, it is still problematic if they are leaning that heavily on the license. Yeah, and even without the license, like there's just stuff that like I don't think the carpet would have mattered. Maybe if you'd seen the movie, you'd know that corner of the room had something in it. I don't know. I think some of it was just art choices. There was a, a particular. No, I don't want to spoil it. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. That's a lot of negatives. I realize. Okay. I don't want people to get the idea that this was a horrible experience. Well, that got to admit that misprinting issue. Don't worry about that. That'll be fixed. That In the final copy, you'll be all good. Except for that. There was a lot to like here. This wasn't a terrible thing. We just obviously we found some problems. The Coded Chronicle system is still brilliant. Like, like I don't know. These games do such a great job of feeling like exploring an area, wandering around and looking at different things and figuring out how to put them together to progress the story. That is still really well done. The story is bang on. Like, like it starts off with a bang. That in media res intro really sets the tone right from the start. You're like, you're not playing Scooby Doo here. You you are in a Stephen King horror. You you are you are in a very different place here with a very different tone. And it really ramped up the tension quickly. And then the tension only gets more intense once that timing mechanic gets in where you're like oh i don't want to keep looking at the things and i didn't want to just combine things randomly because there's a penalty for doing that you really feel like you don't have enough time you're on the run and that you want to be extra careful not to waste time in actions so it does seem like they've really definitely found the tone for mm -hmm. this game and, and and set that you know quite accurately no, I agree. Without knowing the movie, but knowing the general gist, right? Now, most of the puzzles, I got to say, were, were bang on. Like, they were just difficult enough. Like, there were a couple that had a stump for a significant amount of time, but we managed to solve them working together. However, there was one puzzle that did completely stump us due to the fact we failed to find the clues necessary to solve it. Now, this was in Act 2, and as far as I know from Jay, there weren't any printing issues in the second act in our copy so i'm actually still waiting for a confirmation on the op on that because i'm not sure how we could have missed anything but because of this missing clue whether it's our fault or the games again it's, I, I i can't help but sus suspect the game after what happened in act one but let's say it's us we missed it that's fine we literally had to do the solve like not we had to go past the clues and go right to the solution for this and it just happened to be the final puzzle and this is the it's, i'm, I'm going to start calling it the pandemic legacy experience because it's the same thing that kind of soured me on all of pandemic legacy is that our last month of december and pandemic legacy was such a poor game that it's kind of ruined the whole feel well, we kind of got that for this the last puzzle we solved as we escaped and and got out we had to look up the answers that was a little disappointing yeah unfortunately like a fine meal a good game can be ruined by that last bite gone sour yeah so back to positive things right um i thought the implementation of shine was very cool i still don't know exactly what shine's supposed to be but they did some neat stuff that we didn't see in scooby-doo so that was cool and it was actually neat stuff i haven't seen in any other escape room game either so i did cool work there for those who know what i'm talking about you know what i'm talking about um all the ex exploration item finding figuring out how to combine those items um the system basically works really well like i i dig all of that and it feels even more so than scooby-doo like one of those point and click adventures and i think that's a good thing like i'm not trying to say it's bad that it feels like a, i think it's phenomenal that they're able to recreate that feel of like games like mist or the the ones we were talking about earlier and i, I can't remember the telltale series of games like i i like that i felt like i was playing seventh guest right and i think that's a cool thing and for the most part we enjoyed playing the shining uh, escape from Overlook Hotel. Like most of the puzzles were just difficult enough for us to do it. The story was exciting and engaging. The system's brilliant. Like I, I, 
no matter how I feel about this game, I'm still looking forward to the next Coded Chronicles game, which I really want to check out. I want to see what they can do with this. Overall, though, I'm sure you can tell by now, we didn't enjoy this one as much as Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo just seemed tighter, more focused, better written, and the mechanics just worked better. It was less fiddly. We didn't find weird things where we were working up the wrong stuff and combining things the wrong way. Plus, it didn't assume any knowledge or require any knowledge of the source material, which in that I think steps it up a bit that way, that it's going to be more accessible for more people. There were many frustrating moments in The Shining. In particular, we found the U skill to be more annoying than neat. Like it was just too many times like, I don't know, try this with this. Oh, we take another penalty. I try this with this. Okay, how about you try this one, right? And then that combined with issues of not recognizing it, right? Like when we didn't even know what we were interacting with, like, yeah, I'm using a knife with something. And, and then that combined with the, the difficulty to read clues and, and hard to find stuff on the things. And then, well, of course, the printing issues with our copy of the game. Now, again, I, I know this shouldn't affect most people, but I couldn't help that tainting our enjoyment of the game. We had a broken game. We had to kind of hack through to get through it. Now, I'm glad we played The Shining. Unfortunately, though, I can't give this one a very strong recommendation. Now, what I'm hearing from this is that if you are a fan of the film The Shining, you are going to find a lot to like in this escape room in a box game. It seems to do a great job of recreating the tension, the mystery, mm -hmm. and the horror from the film. And this game could be a great way for fans of the movie to experience in a new, rather engaging way, as long as their eyesight's good enough. Yes. Bring a magnifying glass. Seriously, you're going to need one. Now, if you played Scooby-Doo Escape from Haunted Mansion and you really need to play another Coded Chronicles experience, give it a shot. Um, you're going to hopefully all the printing issues are fixed by now. Like according to the op it should be all good. So that should mean you're going to have a better experience than we did. Like it's hard not to be negative on a game that was broken when we were playing it. Now, if you haven't tried a Coded Chronicles game and you're curious about them, I would start with Scooby-Doo. Even if you're not a huge Scooby-Doo fan, it's just, it's simpler, it's tighter, it's more fun, it's lighter, it's fluffier, the puzzles are a little easier, you're not going to get stumped, and there's no way to, like, lose, right? Where in this one, you can lose multiple times, like, there are dead ends, and then you have to back up and resave. You don't find that in Scooby-Doo. I would suggest giving Scooby-Doo a shot, and then if you love it, if you absolutely must have more Coded Chronicles, then maybe give this a shot. Well, for a more in-depth look at The Shining Escape from the Overlook Hotel, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.